Okay, Zainab, thank you so much for agreeing to have a conversation with me. I'm really looking forward to this. Sounds great. I also want to thank you um, for, for inviting me to have this. Um, I, I think it's such an important uh, conversation, this one and many the others that you're having. So yeah, I, I think it's going to be very interesting. Great. Um, well, let's start at the very beginning. So talk about your initial attraction to wanting to make video. Mm hmm. You know, um, my my attraction to working in video really begins at Simon Fraser University. That's the context um, I studied there. Um, I was really interested in the whole sort of relationship between technology and culture. And, you know, Simon Fraser was a radical place. It was called the Berkeley of the North. It, it, it um, and we were really amongst really big debates on decolonization, race, the second wave of feminism. It was a time when you know new women's centers were were or came into being. It was like the I think the first women's studies program actually emerged at Simon Fraser University. So we were in this really rich uh, context with all these discussions going on. Um, and I, I should note that I also come from Kenya, a third world country. That's where I was born and I was a recent immigrant. Uh, I, came, I came to Canada in the 70s, so I was a fairly new immigrant. And, and these were really exciting times. Um, and I think that the relationship between technology and culture and politics was really heightened. And the examples of this are for, you know, for, uh, for me to point out uh, the McBride Commission report. It was really calling for a new communication and information order challenging the dominance of Western communication models and that industry. There was the birth of the Third Cinema Project, right? Mm -hmm. And even the National Film Board. In those days, it was very progressive. It came up with two really key initiatives. One was Challenges for Change, mm -hmm. which became a global model for the use of film and portable video technology to promote social change, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and also in conjunction, um, I think in 74 with International Women's Day, Studio D was created, which was the women's studio of the National Film Board. And so, you know, being at Simon Fraser, um, I was thrust into these heady debates on politics and decolonization, second wave feminism. Um, and interesting, while I was doing a degree in business and economics, uh, I took all my electives in the fine and performing arts. And, and it was actually through a communications and art pro, um, course that I studied video with Manji Pendekar at Simon Fraser. And of course, in the 70s, video was the hottest thing. Right? Mm -hmm. It was the new medium, right? Um, and for me, it was, um, I was very excited about this. It, it was like giving a whole new space uh, for things. And Portapak, Sony Portapak, for example, had come out and it gave voice to those that were outside the studio system. You know, and it created uh -huh. a fusion of media, art, and politics. And as you probably well know, this was called the tactile media movement. Um, and the practitioner was really engaged in kind of um, an aesthetic uh, in the politics of disruption, right? Intervention and education. Um, and I think importantly, what should be say, said that the, the other thing about video was that many artists like me may never have entered the arts. Right? Oh, if it hadn't been for video. Yeah, because it, 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 we would have been stifled by the constraints of you know, utilizing traditional mediums and really the dominance of the Western canon, right? Uh -huh. And you would have gone to study it and you would have learned how to do it formally. But there were so many that entered the art world because this became, you know, really accessible, right? And, and the practice of using video, um, known as video art, <laughs> as we know, and its long history, um, I think it really provided a, an accessible and cheap way of recording and, and represent, representing through this dynamic new avenue, right? And it, in a way, I think it shatters an art world and it's kind of norms around painting and photography and sculpture. Because it was also, 
really embedded in the, you know, it became embedded in the gallery system. It became embedded in different ways. And it was, it was really resonated um, with those involved with conceptual art and performance art and experimental film. So you can see how, how this, you know, um, I, I think that video art really kind of challenged and it expanded the ability of the artists, especially women artists, right? Who, who were able to use this medium. And, and they, they saw it as a way to further the feminist art movement, um, which was all part of that second wave of feminism in Canada, right? And I think the scope of the, the medium, it, it just expanded you know, uh, the scope of individual voices and challenged artists to stretch towards different places and plateaus in their careers. And so, you know, I would say that that it was such an exciting time at, at Simon Fraser and my introduction to the medium was in this context, um, making it very empowering. It, it gave us agency. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you did a video, obviously, and, and that was in 1993. Mm -hmm. And uh, excuse my poor French, but it was a, a coup, uh, su, 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 I can't say it. Yeah, <laughs> Listen, it's, um, if, it's, it, if it is raining. Yeah, écoute s'il pleut. Um, and I made that in 93, uh, much later than I wanted to do work, but I was doing other work, which I'll, which is part of our conversation today. But yeah, I made this um, ex experimental uh, video poem, um, you know, um, that that um, that was really about. It, it actually emer it emerged from this visit to uh, to a trip I made in Montreal, where I was visiting an artist called, um, you probably know him, Robert Racine mm -hmm. in Montreal. He's a really important visual artist. And when I went to visit him and it went to his, his home, I was absolutely struck with the sound of silence. And I said to him, it, your place is so silent. And he said, you're the first person who's been in here after six years. He practically lives like a monk. Oh. And his whole place was, you could feel the silence. It was like there was nothing in there that, that it was just this energy, right? And, and that really uh, struck me um, as, as something that society has lost, had lost. Something that we are no longer able to do, listen. Mm -hmm and be silent and reflect as we were in already entering that acceleration mode, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and today we can't even think like Insta this, Instagram, Insta everything, right? right? But already this was happening. And um, silence and the in-between spaces and language are really central to, uh, are, are a kind of central idiom of my practice. Um, even my most recent work in the last uh, few months on, on redaction, on redacted text and redacted reality um, of, have, are dealing with, with language and silence and, and you know, that space in between, as we say. Um, and even my sound work, for example, at Western Front, um, I, I did this live mix for the Absolute Value of Noise program for Arts Birthday. And it really incorporates this same the idiom that I'm, I'm speaking about. Uh -huh. um, and Robert actually, um, when I made the work, Écoute s'il pleut, um, and I lived in Vancouver where it rains all the time. Uh, I, I asked him if he would, you know, um, he composed the, 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 P, the sound work that's in it. Um, and this actually, this work then became part of an exhibition of experimental video art from Canada's Western provinces at the Museum of Modern Art uh, in MoMA in New York. Uh -huh. uh, and it was called New Canadian Video and it featured 26 video tapes that focused on like issues of history and identity and culture and sexuality vis-a-vis -vis the Canadian experience. Um, yeah, and so um, that's a coup de pleu um that that work came out of that experience uh in montreal 
Well, it definitely sounds like there's like that through line of, of as you say, that silence or the space between words and, mm -hmm. and how you've carried that through throughout your other pieces of work mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. um, and there's no question that, you know, you, you are carrying on your artistic process or practice, mm -hmm. um, but in some ways you're almost better known as a cultural administrator and an arts advocate, uh, an arts critic, uh, mm -hmm. a gallery director, center, art center director as well. I mean, mm -hmm. in a sense, it feels like you kind of morph part of your artistic process into uh, a broader practice that involves art making and cultural policies. Why mm -hmm. do you feel like this is the effective route for you? Well, I, I, um, I can say that it began with video and how it gave a voice to those who are outside and it kind of created this fusion, as I said, of media arts and politics. Um, and this fusion really created interventionist media art practices that really engaged to critique the dominant political and economic order. And I think that we, the work that we were engaged in was in, in an aesthetic of politics of disruption and intervention, as I said. But at the Governor General's exhibition conversation with the Art Gallery of Alberta, um, um, I ha have a conversation with um, Niranjan Raja, who nominated me for that. And, and um, I think that that exhibition really captures my movement um, from art to the institutional work that I did as a pursuit of a more effective transversal praxis. And, and, and Niranjan talks about it, right? As you know, transversality is a concept that was de developed by Qatari and that transverses the irreconcilability of pure verticality. In fact, um, I'm just gonna grab something. Okay. So he says, so he says that my name is perfect. It's like, a, it's like an English fence that has these vertical lines and what I've done is transversely worked across them and, and defied them. And, 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 and this is who I am and this is how I've continued to work. And it doesn't matter whether it's within the institution or through my artwork or, or through in, any engagement in culture um, that I, I have actually um, made this transversal um, that, that so he conceptualizes that my work ma manifests as a practice of a critical transversal aesthetic and 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 so that's what's happened right so I continue to make the art but really my my work. Uh, has worked in this way, or my trajectory has been in this way, and and you know institutional critique is another area that that's been part of that practice. So um, you're you're right in this question of like you know I've done all of these things, but this is the cultural practice that I have. Mm -hmm. Um, well, definitely they're not separate. And I think that, again, like your artistic concerns, your political concerns are always, uh, there's a very strong foundation there. And of course, back in the late 1980s, when you were living in Vancouver, um, you co-founded the now historic um, festival, Invisible Colors, uh, Women of Color and Third World Women International Film and Video Festival and Symposium in mm -hmm. 1989. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the goals for this initiative? Mm -hmm. So um, I, I'd like to um, really give it the, the context of that work and, and how it came together, because I think this is a really important part of the conversation today. Um, so I, I would say that Invisible Colors um, was made, right? It was not found. It was historically produced and it was historically productive. And, and you know, talking of these histories, it kind of really reminds me of, um, you know, Milan Kundera's book, A Book of Laughter and Forgetting. I don't know if you know that book, but where the protagonist, he talks about the struggle of one against power is a struggle between memory and forgetting. And despite its critical success of Invisible Colors, you know, and wide reportage that was available, it took almost 30 years for Canadian mainstream art publication to have a conversation about Invisible Colors. Mm. Okay. 
Um, now the context for all of this was, you know, um, and 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 you'll be really familiar with this. We were in post-war decolonization, right, uh, which led to this like big global societal upheaval, and the former colony colonies, of sites of empire, were now the sites of ideological fights as part of the Cold War between communism and capitalism, United States versus USSR. Um, and in that period, we saw this big movement uh, occur, for example, um, the Latin American women that came, uh, Latin American people that came to Vancouver, women were a really big part of this, refugees from Chile, for example, mm -hmm. right? Um, there was my own personal engagement with the British Black Art Movement, because I'd also been brought up in England, you know, with Stuart Hall and Sankofa and Isaac Julian, the Black Audio Film Collective, you know, third text had emerged as a, as a very important, uh, you know, discourse making, um, doc, you know, um, publication. And then there was Perminder Ver, I, uh, who did Third Eye Festival. It was, um, it was held um, in, it was held in London and Birmingham in 1983. So these were really important. And this, they, they, um, these, this context informed me about the agency I had as a person of color and how I could use that position to kind of intervene on racialized gender issues of cultural production and that whole institutional discourse that had been unleashed by globalization and this kind of new neoliberal order that we were seeing, right? We'd seen Pinochet, Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, who disseminated them, you know, so much in England, right? And especially the Greater, Greater London Council. Um, and I think that, you know, we say that invisible color still remains. And I think our good friend Lynn Fernie has even said that one of the most foundational film events in Canada uh, and its history, and it's critical to the conversation today. But the three things I think that we can say is what invisible colors did was there were three markers, I think, that are really important that it really um, it, it, I, I just want to say it, it came together in also another, another sort of what was also happening that like in, in the third world cinema debates that were happening, the one was in Algiers in the seventies and the next one in Buenos Aires, they were all men and invisible colors was the first event internationally in the world that had brought women together in this way. Mm. And what it did was it foregrounded the histories of struggle of women of color and third world women filmmakers and video makers. It really brought forth that the issues of race to the second wave of feminism. And, and it created this new alignment in the emergent global politics of third cinema. Um, and each of these markers, I think, really left deep imprints on the subsequent set of events that, 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 that it inspired in Canada in the 1990s, right? Uh -huh. um, and you, we were talking about NIF, for example, uh -huh. right? Um, this, this was also a response from Studio D, this new initiatives in film, right? So you know how you can see something before your eyes and you can see that we need to grapple with it and you can't grasp it, but invisible colors grasp that moment. Uh -huh. And it was a forerunner of these phenomena. It, it was able to just take it and, and make something happen. And what Canada doesn't realize, what important work, what an important history this is like globally and that Canada was the site of this. Uh -huh. Vancouver was the site of it, right? And, um, and so I would say that, um, you know, what, what were the goals of Invisible Colors? It, 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 it really, it didn't have goals per se, it took the moment and it, it addressed something that was part of, of, of what was happening in history and in that global context. And it was a contestation to that um, uh, as much, as, as, much as, a, as a coming together. But, you know, we can talk more on that as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no question that I, I, I think everything you said is, is accurate and, and, and uh, especially the, the fact that it's, 
been ignored so long in Canadian history. Um, you, you know, at the, I was there, I was invited to Invisible mm -hmm. Colors. Uh, that's where we met. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but I also remember that there were few Canadian women there. How, mm -hmm. Do you remember how many films or how many Canadian films there were? Yeah, uh, there were 20, exactly, to be precise. And the works were across um, documentaries, short animations, there was video and film, um, the catalog. Great. Um, and there was, you know, uh, Fumiko Kiyuka, Dion Brand, Karen Lee, Loretta Todd, Leila Sujir, Sylvia Hamilton, uh, Claire Prieto, Pramika Ratnam, Gita Saxena, and Marie Fleming, yourself, obviously, Alanis Obwamsuman, and there were others, but there were, there were 20 works, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I'm, uh, you know, I mean, it's understandable that there were even 20 works which doesn't sound like a lot today, but back then I think that the, that was like quite a number of works uh, across genres that, that had been done. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of, um, I guess, Invisible Colors, maybe I should start with a personal little anecdote. Um, when mm -hmm. I got the invitation for Invisible Colors, I was a bit uh, confused. I was very early in my career. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was the, it was the displaced view that was uh, shown at Invisible yeah. Colors, mm -hmm. and um, it was the first work that I had done that was in or looked at in some ways uh, my racial background, my familial history, and I was thrown off by the fact that it was a. Oh, uh, a festival that also included third world women. And so immediately I was wondering where I fit into the landscape of this festival. Yeah. Um, and so I, I just wanna mention a quote uh, that Monica Gagnon wrote in her article in Cine Action. And she says, what emerged from Invisible Colors uh, was a remarkable sense of difference within the sexual and racial differences that have marked women of color working in industrialized nations and women living and working in the third world. While the realization of this festival depended precisely on foregrounding the shared experiences of, 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 of oppression, sexism and racism lived by a global range of women, what the event and the screen works finally made apparent is how these realities are determined by specific social, economic, political, and cultural conditions. I thought that was a, a very interesting statement that to me interpreted some of my feelings of apprehension around the festival. Yeah, so I think Monica um, um, state something that at face value agree, I agree with. She didn't attend um, much of the symposium sessions where I think um, the meat of those discussions took place, especially like centering on the political economy of film and video, like the, the how things were made and why they were made. Um, and I think that you know it, it's it's a very good question you had at that time because what actually happened was there were people of color in this country who had come from other places and were, there were generational, like first, first generation immigrants, there were different generations and we each had an experience of that migration and then living in this country, whether we were born or came. And what happened, I think, is that invisible colors actually brought forward the constant contestation between um, Western feminism and third world feminism. That's, that's what happened. Mm -hmm. And it, it became a site of this contestation, right? Um, so when I say that on the face value of the statement, I agree um, that I, I kind of imply that despite recognizing that contestation, um, that there was still, you know, still propel a universalizing narrative on gender, right? Right? 
I mean, no wonder that the success of Invisible Colors, we also saw that Women in Focus shut down. Mm. It was one of Canada's first media um, media artist run centers, right. Women in Focus, um, and, and it was shut down because of that. And we saw that what just that that disruption that level of of um its ability to intervene right was so powerful and we saw following invisible colors we saw the minkwan panchayat collapse with the collapse of anpac right mm -hmm. it was another state uh, funded institution that was shut down right and this is kind of the wave that invisible colors had begun um and I guess it's good that you said at the outset that this is a conversation, these conversations are really so that the, ge the younger generation, right, will understand their own history and how they got to be where they get to today. Um, because one of the things that has not happened, and as I mentioned, it took 30 years for Canadian, Canadian publication to write something on invisible colors, mm -hmm. that, that neither has this work been taught at schools, at universities. These histories haven't been embedded into the Canadian uh, college and university education system. And, and so these histories are really missing as well in, in terms of this work that was done. And it's really important to understand what those contestations were that took place during, you know. And, and I, I am really interested to hear you say this today that, you know, you yourself were like, where do I fit? What's this got to do with being me as a person mm -hmm. of color in Canada, right? Um, and, and I think it opened up a lot of those questions around uh, what the contestation actually was, because we were embedded within a Canada's second wave of feminism, if we were embedded in any feminist discourse, that was the one, right? Right, yeah. I mean, and, it's, it's, it, it was so fascinating to me. I mean, I was apprehensive about attending it, but as soon as I got there, I was overwhelmed, you know, at the number of incredible uh, women filmmakers uh, that I had met across the globe. Um, I still remember specific conversations that I had with uh, various people from, you know, so many countries that I, I probably never will visit, you know? And uh, also it was an interesting time because we were fairly young, all of us, or younger than today. And uh, so there were people like Mona Hatoum, I think was there, wasn't she? Uh, Tracy Moffat, I know I met her. Uh, you know, these fairly well-known artists today were just starting their careers at that point. And that was really exciting and, and quite uh, inspiring. Absolutely. I mean, I just look back now and I go, Mira Nair, Tracy Moffat went to Khan right after that. Uh, Gorinda Chadha made, you know, Baji on the Beach and Bend It Like Beckham and, and you know, other things, Pratiba Parmar, right? Now in the United States doing that work with um, um, Ava DuVernay. Um, but but um, it, Dion Brand, and there's a quote, and I, I don't have the source right now, maybe we can find it. Um, Dion Brand said, this is one of the most revolutionary uh, events that has taken place. Because it, you know, it was so, uh, I mean, I look at the catalog today, going through it, and I just go, my God, like we did an amazing, we did an amazing thing. Mm -hmm. This was an amazing thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, I, I, it, it's great to have your story in here too, because I think, um, you know, it's been a long time and, it, and it's great to kind of get that reaffirmation of, from your perspective or for somebody who was attending whose work was in it, like what it actually meant and, and what that connection with the others was and what those conversations looked like, you know? Oh, for um, sure. I mean, yeah. it, you, uh, you're, the, the festival has been brought up by other artists, um, uh, Lila Sujir, and uh, I think it really, as we sort of touched on, sparked so many other initiatives, so many other 
um, thought processes that were moments of discussion, community organizing locally. Um, there were so many uh, things that had ignited, you know, it, within the fabric of, of the independent film world or, or the arts world in Canada mm -hmm. and beyond that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, you know, looking at like the landscape today, it's, it's hard to imagine what that festival was like when we, today we have real Asian, we have imagina imaginative, we have um, Alucini, we have all of these other specific community-based uh, film festivals. Did you, if you could see in the future back then, would you have envisioned something like that or would you have envisioned something different? That's, um, that's an interesting question. There's a couple of things. I, I think that one of the things we're grappling with and one of the things that's coming out in the conversation or, or in, in addressing this conversation are things that I wanted to really kind of point to is um, a lot of what we see from, from my perspective is 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 multi multiculturalism working hard at doing its job, right? And it's it's created these these separate events that are now become very market oriented, and it's just about you know the big shows. And there's some independent work which is great, um, but I think uh, the convenient boxes have been created in some sense for me, right? Mm -hmm. Rather than um, you know. Um, the kind of thing that we were doing with Invisible Colors. And to come back to your question, what could I have imagined for the future? And I still keep imagining the same thing, right? Is, 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 is um, a, a very different world, not one in which the tokenism keeps being re-embedded into the conversation. Uh -huh. you know? And the last year really can, you can see in the COVID context as the social crisis rose to the top, we are revisiting those same questions, the same conversations, the same discrimination, racism, systemic barriers, and, 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 and the language is co-opted. Again, in those days, it was a different language. Today's language is different, but that co-option is, is, is creating you know, more tokenism. Um, the thing about that time also is, is that we also worked differently. Um, you know, programmers and distributors were really revolutionaries in the 80s and 90s, right? Um, I'm, I'm saying images in 91 or the critique of the first Gulf War. Those things were coming out from tactile media organizations like Deep Dish, TV and Paper Tiger. You'll remember uh -huh. those names. Um, and they were direct and deep engagement with political articulations. But I think that, um, you know, um, even like right after Invisible Colors, for example, that, that NFB Studios program, you know, the new initiatives and film program. And um, I want to give you a little anecdote. So I received one of those fellowships in 92 uh -huh. and off I went to Montreal <laughs> and with a great cohort. And actually Alanis was in that, a bomb swing. Mar Marjorie uh, Bocage was in it, uh, Molly Shinhat, um, Peter uh, Sondi, and there was a, a few others. And um, we actually, we, uh, we, we were taken to see um, the commissioner of the NFB as part of our Studio D outing, and we occupied that office. What do you mean? We, you know, we took it over. We said we would like you to leave your seat. <laughs> we are now going to occupy your office. And 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 these are these sort of like I don't think we had like a formal. We had a statement about issues of racism, issues of you know, uh, and and discrimination, and that we wanted to hear from the commissioner beyond Studio D. What was the commissioner going to do? Uh, and it was a very powerful moment for us to to take those kinds of steps, but we we were empowered uh -huh. to do that. And and those interventions that were made, um, those were the kinds of interventions that we were making. I mean, the idea of occupying at that time, uh, it, it was um, it, that we did those things, right? Those were the statements. Right. Um, 
But I think that work has been neutralized, um, or shall I say neoliberalism, um, the, where the role of identity has a completely different valency, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, I mean, so, so it, my future is that we, we can't stop the work, you know, the, the critical, what, what Invisible Colors did was we had a discourse mm -hmm. uh, in which we could really come together and, and think about what our position in the world was. And I think we had a better understanding of our place in the political economy. But I think the, the, it's not that we had a discourse, it's that we developed the discourse together. And, and I strongly believe that. I believe that it came out of conversations and opportunities yeah. like Invisible Colors. In, it, invisible it, wasn't colors. Like, it wasn't a set agenda. It wasn't a systemic or, or pre-formed pre box that you we all it. fit you into. It was something that we all developed together. And for me, as I speak to other artists and other women who were around at that time, I think the one thing that we're, we're commenting on is that it was a different way of working. So back then, my recollection is much more of cross communities. It wasn't real Asian over here, this group over here, that group over there. It was that we were all in one space and all arguing and all talking and all pushing our own personal agendas or our community agendas forward, but we would always find a place to meet. We would always find a common landing. Whereas I'm not sure if that discussion happens today. You, you know, you've hit the nail on the head. So I, I think you're absolutely right in that what has been broken is our solidarity. We can no longer, first of all, the whole neoliberal workforce diversity and inclusion framework is actually about management, managerialism. It's not about bringing people together, asking and, and developing those things together. So the whole, the whole discourse, the whole coming together, our solidarity ha has been completely broken. And, and we are actually not able to talk to each other. Now we've been compartmentalized very neatly under mm -hmm. this framework so that we don't actually speak together. It's, it's almost like, you know, bread and chocolates, like you just go off and do your thing or, you know, you sit in your part of the circus and let somebody else get on with theirs. And, and there's, there's nothing that in, in the world that we live in that's allowing or opening up these spaces for discussion. And, and um, I think that there's, there's kind of an apartheid that's been created, a multicultural apartheid and, and, and even others for that matter, uh, in which we have been completely separated so that, that our agency has been taken away in that sense. Mm -hmm. is, is, is I think you're right there, you know. I, I mean, I think that, you know, when you, you talk about incidents like occupying uh, the National Film Board uh, office, I, I, I mean, that to me is so empowering. And what I think people don't quite understand is that that was one of the, the bastions of Canadian cinema, Canadian identity. You know, I grew up with the loon videos and the mask, muskrat, life of the muskrat, the life of the beaver uh, on TV, NFB, that was what they did, you know, to, so for someone who was not white, who was not man, a man, uh, going into that space itself, just walking in the door was a statement, you know? Absolutely. And, and even, even, um, you know, and I, I, I met that commissioner recently at a hot dogs, actually Barbara Jane. So the Invisible Colors was a partnership between the National Film Board and Women in Focus. And surprisingly, the National Film Board even doesn't have a record of it as its own event of Invisible Colors. Um, but but I, I recently met that commissioner, actually. I met with Barbara Jones because she, she does the Women's Festival in the Atlantic, mm -hmm. and she's on the board there. And, and, she, and I met with her when she came to Hot Dogs, I guess, before COVID, the year before. 
And uh, we had a great conversation about the making of invisible colors from that perspective. But but I met that commissioner and she just looked at him. She goes, I remember you. <laughs> <laughs> Who, me? <laughs> Who, me? And, and I was like taken aback. I was like, my goodness, we must have, I, I think we must have shook, shook that person because not literally like physically, yeah. but but they must have been very shaken that that we we actually went in there and did that. And as you said, here was this this you know even just to enter the doors of the national film board or something, right? Let, let alone have any other space within that. Yes, know? absolutely. Um, but of course, even Studio D is gone, and we've all that important. Um, all those all those institutions have been broken down, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know, again, it's not that any uh, like new initiatives in, in film wasn't perfect, but it was a place no. of starting, you know. And and looking back now, thirty years later, mm -hmm. um, of course, we can see that the the numbers have increased in terms mm -hmm. of productions by people of color, indigenous artists. Um, and, and definitely the genres have expanded. Mm. But is, is this a mark of success? Um, I would say that, you know, we're on it, this arc. I recently was um, in another talk and, and, and similar issues were being, being discussed. And I would say the pro that we're on an arc. I would say that progress has been made, but no change hasn't. Right. Uh, and I think the numbers are not a true indicator of change. You know, that's that evidence data is very problematic. Um, and and I think it puts us in, in this sort of historic bind of positivism versus critical where the positive ideas are favored. I think more than numbers, we need the discourse, that discourse that you and I just spoke about, that we created, that we came together in under solidarity to 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 understand the political economy in which we we work, right? Mm -hmm. And and what is our role, you know, um, in the world in civil society? What is our role in the art world? What is our how how does this all function? Uh, not function. How how does the political economy, you know, um, really? It, it's manipulating us, right? In, mm -hmm. in a particular way, the frameworks that are in place. Absolutely. Not allowing us to, to have these, dis, these discourses. Uh, and we really need one, right? Um, so I think that um, we have, we always have that opportunity to create that space again. Um, and I think my big takeaway from COVID in, in my work that I've been doing is that we can, we have the ability, we must reimagine ourselves. And it can't be reimagining fitting into the frameworks that have been given to us. Uh -huh. We have to recreate uh, something different, or we have to create something different. And, and that has to happen with discourse. Mm -hmm. and solidarity it cannot happen in in empty you know um, siloed ghettoized spaces that have been created for us to operate in mm -hmm. or even entertain the hierarchy of oppression exactly mm -hmm. so i i mean it, it sounds like this is the recipe for tomorrow is is more conversation more dialogue more questioning, more arguing, more, more, more fists raised, more pounding on the table, um, and more joy. You know, more laughter too. It, it is finding that that shared something that will will make us stronger. You know. Yeah, and 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 that requires um, it requires work. Right, and I don't just mean organizing work. It requires learning. It requires understanding your history. It requires, um, 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 you know, really understanding um, the political economy. It really understanding like what are the binds and what is, what has to be broken. So uh, yeah, absolutely, you're right, and it, and it also has to have joy. Mm -hmm. I right. think that, you know, it, it's so 
interesting having this conversation because you come from always a, a, a place of art making, a, a place of creativity, but you have such a, a, a vast knowledge of uh, political activism and uh, how organizations work and how they're structured. And your experience is so layered and complex that I think we need, as you just said, not just filmmakers to come together, but we need uh, economists, we need alternative thinkers, we need all of these different sets of people to, to try and figure out what are our next steps. Yeah, and, and absolutely. And, and um, you know, um, I, I just got into just a couple of things um, that I want to say is that this work that we're doing, this conversation is really important as the other ones that you, as you are having with the other people. Um, and the institution cannot tokenize these. This, this in itself can be a platform for something to emerge that, that would be much stronger. Uh, or, or you know, allow us to to bring a, allow to bring us together in the ways that we need to, and the and it, it's crucial because what has not happened enough, I think, are the intergenerational conversations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would right? agree. Yeah, and and this is really important work uh, because you know when 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 we die, the voices die, die with it with us and and so we need to get these stories out we need to share and think through these things with younger generation and have those intergenerational conversations because that's that's a space that needs to be worked every day it needs to it needs to be very strong and and we really need that if we're going to make any any steps towards some larger change Yes, absolutely. I think you're you're you, you've said it so perfectly. I mean, um, you know, given the opportunity from the CFMDC to to do these uh, events during the month of April is is a gift, um, and I think that it's uh, been really interesting talking to you and and hearing your perspective on both what happened then and what's happening now. And I do feel encouraged, you know, I feel like maybe this is not the start of Invisible Colors too, but it is hopefully a start to a larger discussion and many discussions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it takes one, one small thing, um, which seems apparently small, that can lead to something else. Um, you know, I learned this at the very beginning of my journey as, as, a, as, a, as a really, literally, I'd only been in the country two years and there was a, uh, I was in theater, I got into theater with Leon Pownall, who was a director who, who did, um, who started a company called Institutional Theater Productions in 1977. It was a program at the University of Victoria and basically they worked with federal security prison, medium security prison and Matt Squee to do a theater program so that the inmates would get their, would get a degree, would be able to study and get a degree. And, and just working with, in that forum as an, as an immigrant who'd only been here two years in my early twenties, very impressionable. Like you, you know, like we were, we were just starting, like with this all very exciting. And, and what I learned there was the transformational power of art and uh -huh. culture. Um, because after, afterwards, the, the, um, somebody from the, from the prison took over institutional um, productions and, and it was part of rehabilitation work for prisoners. Uh, and it was just absolutely fantastic. It was just one of the most amazing programs. And it actually began my Canadian journey passionately advocating for critical and, and, and the central role of art and culture in our society. And I think it really learned, what I learned is that art does have this huge power to make us think and question the world we live in and to take action and to find our agency, which is exactly 
you know, um, um, the endeavor, right, to, to come together to build a much better and inclusive Canada in, in the way that, in the, in the most civil way that artists can. So I, I'm bringing it back to the art because it really was what propelled me. Uh -huh. um, and it still does. Um, but as I say, you know, I work across like this. <laughs> What's really, really key, I think, in this conversation is why are we at the place that we are? And I really have to say it goes back to the Massey-Levesque report. Mm. It is exactly the, the policy document that has defined official culture in this country in which everybody who's not fitting under the two founding nations of the Western canon art world is out is left out right okay. um and and it and people say that's a really old document but it still determines exactly what will be seen as canadian culture and what won't be accepted what will be canadian and what will be ethnic and we are still falling within those ethnic bounds right this year is its 70th year and i think the uh, 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 just a uh, just a conversation on Massey Levesque itself would be really interesting because that actually has set the stage for what we're still experiencing today. Hmm. That's very interesting. Yeah. So I, I, um, I don't think we can have conversations without examining, um, you know, um, the, the, do, the, the policy document that has created the framework, right? And I, my work in the Art Gallery of Alberta GG exhibition has actually it's called amnesia and it has the copy, the, the, uh, the, rare, the rare document um, in, a, in a case there because it really speaks to the, the, the struggle that we've, we've just talked about. But, but I think that, you know, it, it, it's, it's just, I feel very energized having had our discussion, you know, and, and that's, mm -hmm. that's also what I felt with the other conversations I've been having and it, it makes me hopeful, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I, and we can't give up that hope. I, I think um, we have to remain energized and we have to energize others in this work because it's ongoing work, right? It's never stops. Um, so I'm, I'm really glad that, you know, we were, we've been able to do this because I think that, um, all those points that we talked about and with the others and that intergenerational work, you know, is, is really crucial and, and there have to be many interventions and this is one of them, the conversation itself. Well, thank you so much. Thanks, Midi.